For decades, every Mars base design looked the same. Modules, assembly, underground construction. Then Musk proposed something radical. Land starship vertically, tip it horizontal, instant base. No legs, no building required. Jared Isaacman just became NASA Administrator with Project Athena, targeting Mars base by 2028, and this approach is central to it. But here's the twist. What if everything we thought about building on Mars was completely wrong? For the past 50 years, every Mars-based design followed the same blueprint. Send multiple habitat modules separately, land them, then have astronauts spend months assembling everything on the surface. NASA's reference architecture calls for at least six cargo flights before the first crew even launches. Each module needs its own descent system, its own power, its own life support during the six-month journey. The European Space Agency proposed inflatable structures, transported compact, then expanded and connected via pressurized tunnels. Sounds efficient until you face reality. Every seal between modules is a potential failure point. Every connection requires spacewalk time in lethal conditions. Every assembly step multiplies risk. Then there's the lava tube strategy that gained serious traction recently. Mars has enormous underground tunnels formed billions of years ago, some potentially hundreds of meters wide. Natural radiation shielding, stable temperatures, protection from dust storms. But here's what the studies downplay. These tubes sit 50 to 100 meters underground. You'd need to lower habitats and equipment down vertical shafts using cranes that don't exist yet, then construct living spaces while wearing spacesuits. One Mars Architecture Steering Group paper estimated 18 months of continuous spacewalk work just to establish basic infrastructure inside a lava tube. What binds all these approaches together? Complexity. Every traditional design multiplies the number of things that must go perfectly right, often in sequence, with zero margin for error. The question nobody seemed to ask was, what if instead of figuring out how to build a base on Mars, we should be asking how to avoid building altogether? That's where Musk's concept changes everything. Starship doesn't just transport the base, it becomes the base. Land it vertically using Raptor engines as designed, tip it horizontal, and you have a ready-made habitat with more volume than the entire International Space Station. Real numbers tell the story. Starship's crew section stands over 50 meters tall with a 9-meter diameter. Horizontal, that's roughly 1,000 to 1,200 cubic meters of pressurized space. The ISS offers about 915 cubic meters after 13 years of assembly across 42 separate launches. Starship delivers more in a single flight. During the Mars journey, Starship's interior is dominated by propellant tanks, massive containers for liquid methane and oxygen, essential for transit and landing. But once you're on the surface, they're just empty metal taking up space. The conversion involves carefully removing or repurposing these tanks, opening up the full interior for human habitation. SpaceX designs show segmented tanks allowing selective removal while maintaining structural strength. You could create separate zones, living quarters, laboratories, medical areas, with the nose cone becoming a multi-level observation center. What makes this genuinely clever is pre-integration. On Earth, with unlimited time and resources, you outfit the entire interior before launch. Life support systems, radiation shielding, equipment racks, sleeping quarters, hydroponics. Everything tested, everything verified, ready to function the moment you land. Compare that to astronauts assembling unfamiliar equipment while dealing with six months of deconditioning, communication delays, and limited consumables. The stainless steel hull provides the first radiation layer, about four millimeters thick currently, though Mars versions might go thicker. Not enough alone for galactic cosmic rays, but it's a foundation. 
Add layers, water tanks in the walls for shielding, polyethylene panels in sleeping areas, and Martian regolith piled outside once settled. Does this eliminate all Mars construction? No, and that honesty matters. You still need to stabilize the horizontal vehicle, level the landing site, possibly pour foundation. The regolith covering needs robotic equipment to move and place. But all that supports an already functional habitat. The moment Starship lands, you have breathable air, power, temperature control, life support. You're not racing against consumables to complete construction. You're enhancing an existing base at your own pace. That difference is enormous. The critical question, can a horizontal steel tube really protect humans on Mars long term? The answer lives in multiple engineering layers working together. Starship handles launch stresses of several Gs and re-entry temperatures exceeding 1,400 degrees Celsius. Horizontal on Mars, structural loads are gentle, 0.38 GE gravity, no atmospheric pressure differential since interior is pressurized and exterior is near vacuum. The main stress becomes weight distribution along the horizontal axis, easily managed with support structures at intervals. Temperature swings on Mars run from minus 140 degrees Celsius at winter nights to occasionally plus 20 degrees Celsius near the equator, a 160 degree range. Starship's thermal system, designed for cryogenic propellants, is overbuilt for this. Active heating and cooling loops circulate through hull and interior, while multi-layer insulation minimizes thermal exchange. The regolith covering dampens fluctuations further, creating stable conditions inside. Radiation deserves detailed attention because it's often cited as the deal-breaker. Galactic cosmic rays and solar events are real threats. Earth's atmosphere and magnetic field provide shielding equivalent to 10 meters of water. Mars has neither. The solution combines strategies. Stainless steel hull provides baseline protection. Water tanks add hydrogen-rich shielding where critical sleeping quarters get polyethylene panels and one to two meters of regolith adds substantial mass shielding. NASA studies suggest these combined layers reduce exposure to levels comparable to ISS astronauts, elevated from Earth, but manageable for multi-year missions. Life support redundancy benefits from Starship's size. You're not cramming into a capsule. Room exists for backup systems, spare parts, alternative technologies. Multiple independent loops mean if one CO2 scrubber fails, others continue. Water recycling uses both proven ISS technology and experimental systems in parallel. Power comes from deployable solar arrays initially. Mars receives 43% of Earth's solar energy, so you need more panel area, but several hundred square meters could provide 20 to 30 kilowatts. Later, Small nuclear reactors supplement this, providing continuous power regardless of dust storms. The validation comes from comparing failure modes. In modular bases, seal failures could isolate crew or cut off critical systems. In lava tubes, structural collapse could trap everyone underground. With Starship, your failure modes are contained. A hull breach, extremely unlikely given thickness and design, affects one section, not everything. Internal bulkheads close, isolating damage while you repair. You're working within a proven pressure vessel that survived the journey from Earth. Project Athena transforms this from theory into timeline. Isaac Mann's 62-page blueprint calls for complete NASA reorganization within 180 days of confirmation which happened weeks ago. By mid-2025, NASA's structure could look radically different. The document targets bureaucratic layers accumulated over decades. Major centers have 30 days to submit consolidation proposals, specifically aiming to increase engineers and technicians versus administrators. Every approval layer removed potentially saves months on compressed Mars timelines. The financial game-changer 
NASA currently spends three to five billion dollars annually on Space Launch System and Orion. Athena proposes completing Artemis two and three, then shifting that entire budget toward Mars initiatives. Suddenly, four billion dollars per year becomes available for Starship development, Mars surface systems, in situ resource technology. At that funding level, you could develop 10 to 15 specialized Mars starships annually, plus ground equipment, ISU demonstrations, and robotic precursor missions. Isaac Mann's timeline is aggressive, but not fantasy. First uncrewed starship to Mars in 2026, just 18 months away. This validates landing, tests, ISU equipment, deploys surface infrastructure like solar arrays and communication relays. It retires the highest risks before humans commit. The 2028 window target's first crewed landing. That's three years from now. Starship already flies regularly in Earth orbit. The vehicle design is mature. Raptor engines are proven. What remains is Mars specific validation, long duration life support, radiation exposure data, landing precision, ice are you at scale. The Isaac Man Musk relationship accelerates everything. These aren't two organizations negotiating contracts. This is direct collaboration between NASA's administrator and SpaceX's chief designer. When Athena calls for nuclear electric propulsion to complement Starship, it's explicit partnership. NASA brings kilo power reactors and nuclear expertise. SpaceX provides transport and surface infrastructure. The document describes NEP as a perfect match for Starship, nuclear systems for efficient transit, Starship handles heavy lift and surface operations. The nuclear timeline runs parallel. 2025 to 2028 proves a single reactor in space, potentially on Mars flyby. Later phases scale to megawatt-class systems for crewed missions, eventually building a fleet of nuclear spacecraft shuttling between Earth and Mars. Combined with growing starships stationed on Mars as permanent habitats, a small outpost evolves into something larger. But challenges remain real. Technical hurdles include validating closed-loop life support for multi-year missions, developing reliable ISRU producing propellant from Martian atmosphere and water ice, creating medical capabilities for surgery without Earth support, establishing communication networks with 20-minute delays, each is solvable but requires focused engineering and realistic testing. What Athena represents is betting that simplicity and speed overcome complexity and caution. Rather than 20 years planning the perfect modular base, you land a functional starship in three years and improve iteratively. Each landing brings another complete habitat, more redundancy, more capability. By 2035, you might have 10 to 15 starships on Mars, some habitats, others workshops, greenhouses, storage. That's not a base, that's the beginning of a settlement. The no-legs approach isn't just about avoiding landing gear, it's philosophy. The vehicle that transported you becomes your home. The fuel tanks become interior space. Every component serves multiple functions, maximizing utility while minimizing what you bring from Earth. So here's what it comes down to. For decades, we overcomplicated Mars. The breakthrough isn't more technology. It's using what we already have smarter. Land Starship, tip it over, your home. With Isaac Mann leading NASA and Athena's 2028 target, this might actually happen in our lifetime. If you found this valuable, hit that like button, subscribe to New Space Review for more Mars updates, and drop your thoughts below. Would you trust this design with your life? Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.